Thing. Order! Order! You are an incorrigible delinquent at times. <laughs> Behave yourself, man! And we're joined now by the former Working Pension Secretary and Leave campaigner Ian Duncan Smith. Welcome back to the Andrew. program. Uh, the BBC is reporting that you, you've said we could be out of the European Union by 2018. How does that work? Well, it depends hugely, obviously, what the nature of the ask is. But my sense about this, which is in the paper that some of my colleagues and myself published yesterday, what we're saying is if you keep uh, the process as simple as possible. Don't go trying to get special pleading, asking for something, for example, like being a member of the single European uh, market, which they're not going to grant you. You know that's not going to happen, so why get bogged down in mm. detail? If you go for a much clearer and simpler position on trade, free trade, etc., find an arrangement, or go to the WTO, then a lot of the more complex issues then start to disappear. And if you do something, which is, uh, Theresa May has said today, which is quite interesting, is that when she brings the Act forward, which we recommended to repeal the 70 to act. Uh, at the same time, you bind in uh, all existing regulations in European law. You speed the process up. You don't start dealing with stuff immediately. You wait till afterwards. So keeping it simple, keeping pace is what we were recommending, and I'm certainly keen on, allows you, therefore, to get to the end point uh, quicker. But I think what you want is... Uh, you, I you talk about membership of the single market. Chris Grayling on this program told me there was no such thing as membership of the single market, which slightly puzzled me. Um, but you clearly think that there, there is. What you want, as I understand it, is a free trade agreement with the European Union. That couldn't be done by 2018. We want free trade. Now, there are two approaches to getting free trade with the European Union. Uh, the first is that you say, OK, in this process, if we simplify it and we ask ourselves, uh, if we now have a new relationship, in other words, we've left, but what's the key thing we want, which is capital goods, etc., you want to access their markets, they want to access ours, it benefits you more than it does us, but we're happy not to have any tariff barriers on your trade. We have an agreement about no tariff barriers. Obviously, financial services are outside. That's a slightly separate issue, but that's more a regulatory issue. But that is also approaching a deal anyway on equivalence which we could accelerate. So the point I'm simply saying is if you don't go down the road of trying to nominate individual bits and pieces and issues and you simply say this is a good agreement for us both to have, you could reach that by agreement. But if you don't and you can't, what you have is you can fall back on the WTO arrangements right. and, and, say, and then say we'll later on end the process, continue that negotiation and discussion to decide whether or not we want to formalise and, the free trade position. And if you end up falling back on that, what do you say to the boss of Nissan, who said he won't uh, invest again in this country unless, if he faces tariffs, unless the government compensates him? Well, there's the big if, isn't there, really? And the answer to that is, first of all, I don't believe we will end up in the situation where it is in any way the financial benefit for the European Union to want to impose any kind of tariff. But the second point I'd say to him is, right now, you are 12% better off anyway, because the level of the pound has made you 12% more competitive with the European Union partners, even but if you slapped a 10% on, you're still better off. But he can't bank that, off. can he? We no, know but like he can't bank the future. Up and down, I mean, but you're asking him to take investment decisions without multi-billion pound investment yeah. decisions. The head of Jaguar is saying roughly the same thing. At a time of real uncertainty, until this is resolved... Yeah, of course. Uh, foreign investment in Britain is going to slow down, if not dry up, isn't it? Well, I, my view is that they invest in Britain for two reasons. The first is because this is a damn good place to set up your businesses. And you heard from the head of the publishing set up in Germany the other day, he said that Britain in five years' time will be a much better place, a much more profitable marketplace than anywhere else, and that'll be the boom place in the, in the continent of Europe. And he, the reason he says that is because once outside the European Union, it will be more flexible to be able to set our new arrangements. So I'm with him on this. But the key point I simply say to, and I was in business before I came into politics, nobody knows what the future holds in anything. But for car makers and others who want to build stuff. The first reason why they're here is because they have a very flexible workforce, they have a, a much lower level of cost, and they have a much better contract law base. Now, that is worth a huge amount. And 85% of Nissan's output goes to the single market. Exactly right. That's but the point lot. is, they also sell here. So my point is to them, is you're not 15%. suddenly, but you're not suddenly going to meet a massive tariff wall, because it is simply not in the interests of the European Union to set up massive tariffs, because guess who sells more to us than we do to them? It's okay. the European Union. And the Germans themselves well, are actually quietly behind the scenes talking to us and saying this is not what we All want. right. We had all of that during the referendum. Yeah. We're still well. waiting for it.
it to work out. Let me move on to uh, some other things. Uh, Damien Green, uh, now running your own department, he's scrapping repeated tests for the serious and disabled, people that you know are, are not going to be able to pass them. Why didn't you do that? Well, we actually wanted to change this position because this was a program given to us at the last Labour government. We tried to improve it. We did quite a lot to improve it. But the biggest problem here is for the uh, program as it exists at the moment, <coughs> it doesn't deal with health conditions. It deals with ability to work. And that is the problem. For scrapping it, if you want to scrap it for people who have health conditions, you have to change the criteria by which they are then assessed. And that has always been the issue. For disability payments, it's a different matter altogether. There they are assessed on their condition. Uh, so the problem for the... So he's going to stop the assessments of, pe of people who are seriously disabled. Well, what they're... Why didn't you do that? No, no, this is not seriously disabled. These are people who suffer from sickness conditions, not necessarily full-time disability. So the key point I make is there are two elements here that are paid. Now when we were, uh, when I was in government, we had already set out a process which said we needed to change the way that the sickness benefit system was actually assessed so that you could rule out conditions, mm. some of them progressive, some of them absolute, which were on a medicalized basis on the uh, approval of the health service. So they would then uh, say this is a condition that will change, it will mean they can't work now but they might be able to work for a bit and sure. you put that into a box marked medical condition. That was already on the stock. But stops. he's just done that to a claim. Let me try for a third time. Yeah. Why didn't you just do it if it's that simple? Well, we needed to get agreement in government to do all this well, stuff, and we hadn't it? reached government uh, approval at that particular stage. But the, well, it's a wider plan, uh, by the way. It's, it's, this is the very But smallest... this could have been implemented on well, its own, couldn't it? Yes, yes but it, implementing is going to be mean you'd have to change the way you do it. So I, I was in favour of a much bigger plan that brought social care, disability and health uh, changes all into one because they're all competing with each other okay. and they don't get the kind of effect that you want. But of course it's the right thing to do. But actually, up until now, there haven't been a huge number of these assessments taking place anyway because the system hasn't been able to cope with it. Uh, there's a lot of talk here about how Mrs May is trying to reposition the Tory party onto the centre ground, even the centre left, talking <coughs> about workers' rights and so on. That's not credible until she does something, is it? Because we live in a country where six million people now earn less than the living wage. After six years of Conservative government, six million people earn less than the living wage. That's the reality, not the Tory rhetoric that we're hearing in the hall. Until something's done about that, I would suggest we should discount the rhetoric. Well, of course, that is exactly what the whole idea of raising the minimum wage was all about, which is to try and make sure, <coughs> as you identify that, you lift everybody's but wages up. But there's still up. six million below. And another point, is before I bring the power I put to you, yep. is that the mantra of this government, going way back to 2010, was to make work pay. Mm -hmm. But 50% of the families in poverty in this country have at least one family member at work. Yeah. But they're still in poverty. They're working, doing difficult jobs, unpleasant jobs, long hours. They're still in poverty. For many people in this country, work is still the equivalent of poverty. It doesn't Work doesn't pay for them. Well, there has been a huge, Why has that not there been, has been a huge problem down at the low skilled level of work. This is the one area where um, it's been resistant to pushing salaries and incomes up for two good reasons. The first is the level of skilling at that point is arguably some of the lowest in the Western world. Uh, companies too often do not invest in skilling because of the nature of the tax credit system, which means you have them in little packets of 16 hours. It's not worth your while investing in them. Universal credit is rolling out. Now, that will change all of that quite dramatically because it allows people to work more of the hours. It allows you to invest more in them. The second aspect is, again, back to the migration issue. That has had a very damaging effect on low workers. And there's two elements of this. It's, not, even the, it's, the panel, it's not just the, the, the statutory migration, it's that what happened was a lot of people come in for under a year. They come in, they do part-time work, they claim full benefits. Uh, with Migration Watch just proved it's over four billion a year. And what that does allows them then to settle there and go off and do cash and hand work. This has been a big problem and it's only now becoming clear just how damaging that's been to British people working at low level of income. Ian Duncan Smith, thank you for that. Tom, what does this party, if it's the self-styled workers party now, what does it have to do in a country where six million people earn less than the living wage? Fifty percent of people in poverty are already in work and indeed poverty levels among those in work are at record levels. What's that worth so much for the Workers' Party? The answer is it has to do an awful lot. But 
Interestingly, fascinating, this is, I think, unfortunately, because we've been talking about Brexit an awful lot over the last two or three mm. months, Theresa May's dropped a whole load of hints already about precisely what it is she does want to do. For example, the announcement that went into yesterday morning about this massive review, led by a Blairite, you know, Taylor, Matthew mm. Taylor, to completely re-examine uh, employment rights, thereby meaning for, you know, for the, for the low-paid and for the casual workers. So, for example, holiday pay for Uber drivers, and it opens up a massive area of things. Grammar schools potentially to uh, upskill uh, kids a bit better. So when you need uh, high quality technology schools to upskill kids rather than grammar schools. Which could be or could not be grammar schools. I'm, I'm not here to defend mm. their policy. I'm simply all saying right. she well, has all this on her agenda and, and I think it's potentially something possibly more interesting than Brexit, dare I even say. Well that's why I'm moving away from uh, Brexit and not planning to mention it in this segment, though I think I just did. Um, <laughs> There's a lot of flesh before this to be put on these bones before it's convincing, I would suggest. Yeah, I think what's very interesting is Theresa's playing a political game, Theresa May's playing a political game of trying to dump the nasty party image she herself talked about, become a more sort of compassionate mm. conservative. But what she's doing, which is quite significant, is she's changing from the David Cameron era. So instead of being the bottom 10, 15 percent of people who David Cameron was focusing on, as well as the sort of wealthier, uh, elites. She's she's looking at those people who are earning more than sixteen thousand up to sort of twenty one thousand. The people who are, whose children aren't on free school meals. Mm. They're not the most deprived. They're working. She calls them the just managing classes. You know, they might have one foreign holiday a year. You know, mm. they want to send their kids to the, you know, piano lessons, the local sure. football club. But they're not the sort of the really hard, um, the most mm. poorest people who are on welfare. And that could have, that could have an impact on what you're saying. But it could also actually undermine her reputation for being compassionate, if she seemed to be abandoning the people who, who yeah. need help most from the government. There's always a political case for doing something for Middle Britain. That's where most people are. And in America, they call it Middle America and so on. But these are not the people who are in work, but in poverty. And if being a workers' party, particularly a party that dines out in its support for work, if it means to do anything, it has to do something about these people. And, and therefore, the key issue is what um, the economic policies are of this, in effect, new government, which we don't really know. So, for example, no one on the programme this morning has talked about the deficit, which George mm -hmm. Osborne framed everything around mm -hmm. to the point where, as Ian Duncan Smith knows better than anyone, uh, he struggled to get some of his welfare reforms to be effective because of arbitrary cuts which hit those on low income in work. Um, and so until we know uh, the degree to which the framing of that deficit strategy has changed, we won't really know the space they will have to make sure that doesn't happen over the next few years and indeed the opposite happens. But, but, and that applies to all these issues actually. But I mean, the, 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 the economy will provide the space or not to the, do these things. The Treasury is telling the Chancellor, Mr Hammond, that the slowdown in the economy, not going to be as slow as they thought, but they still think a slowdown, that in itself will widen the deficit. Uh, and therefore he's not going to have a ton of money to throw around on top of that, which would widen the deficit even further. So his room for manoeuvre could be quite slight. Uh, not quite true. For the massively important reason that he's abandoned George Osborne's fiscal targets. Yeah, he but that's already, to, there's no but, deficit but left to, to worry about. they've already taken that into account by the, what they think is the slowing of the economy. Now, they could be wrong, they've been wrong in the past, mm. but that's why they've done that. There's not a ton of money around to, then to, to spend billions on infrastructure. Unless, of course, like Mr. Corbyn, you want to borrow it. Which is, which is exactly, when you say, I'm not going to eradicate the deficit by 2020, that's what you mean. He's going to allow, if he feels the need to cushion Britain from the Brexit impact, if, if there is one, Ian would say there isn't one. Uh, I don't think we could get anywhere near paying off the deficit by 2020. And then you've got all this money to do with whatever you want. Final thought in the last 20 seconds. There's also an issue about business and the attitude to the super rich and wealth, which I think Theresa May is going to focus on more, perhaps, than David Cameron, which could... Uh, alleviate people's concerns. And, and it means the autumn statement will be, from the Chancellor, will be as big as any of the speeches we hear this week, I suspect. In well, I'm glad to hear it because we'll be covering it live on a daily politics special. <laughs> Thank you all.